Father, right now, by your gracious spirit, oh God, deliver the word that you would have me to do tonight. And I thank you for it. I give you every praise and glory for every opportunity that you give. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. I uh, just a little bit about me. Yes, I'm Pastor Al here at New Season. You probably haven't seen me in the last two years because I've been back in the wonderful state of Virginia with my daughter and my son-in-law and their four children, age eight, 18 months, and five months. Four. And uh, that is a miracle in itself. Because, you see, I'm one of those people that probably shouldn't be here. I don't know about you, but uh, uh, if you would talk to my wife's sister, Mercedes, she could probably tell you about how many times. I have frequent flyer miles at the hospital. I just tell you that when I go and I tell them I want my pillows fluffed and some more of that hot toddy put up in the bag up over there. And, and carry me on because sometimes it's two weeks sometimes it's three weeks a couple of times it's been some really weird stuff and sometimes the Lord lets me out of there in a hurry but all the time I'm always kind of in this spot where I get a chance to minister even in the midst of those crises and so I love the Lord for what he's done with that. I'm not going to talk about that much tonight because I really want to talk to you about evangelism. And, um, and very briefly, again, one other thing is, is I used to teach at a Bible college a few years ago. And so you're not going to hear me hoop and holler, but I will explain to you as best I can. And a lot of times it comes out as stories, and so you will hear a couple of stories tonight. If you have your Bibles with you, I actually said that. <laughs> wow. That's a little bit different, but okay. If you have your Bibles with you, one of the places I'm going to go today is the first chapter of the Gospel of John. John is one of my favorite writers in the New Testament, okay, because he talks about the Messiah. I mean, Matthew talks about the King of Kings, Mark talks about the servant, Luke talks about the man of God. But it is John who talks about the Messiah, the Messianic one. The one, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. In the Gospel of John, the writer talks about two of John the Baptist's disciples meeting the Messiah for the first time. This encounter portrays two very important principles in the Christian faith. Discipleship and evangelism. In this story, Jesus is going along and all of a sudden John the Baptist says, Oh, there he goes. The Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. And so two of his disciples, we learn later in, in Scripture that it's actually the Apostle Andrew and it is the Apostle whom the Lord loves. John, we find that out later. He's never actually mentioned in that account of Scripture. And John chapter 1, verses 38 and 39. So Jesus asked them a very initial question. What are you looking for? And in this case, it really actually speaks to the doctrine of discipleship. Why? Because in order for you to learn anything, you've got to know what it is that you want. And so unless that can be identified, then you don't know which direction you're going to go in. And, and a lot of times it's not going to make a whole lot of sense to you. So what do these two future apostles say? They're disciples of John the Baptist. And they say, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Jesus' response to them was simply come and see and we're going to go back to that later on but it's an incredible thing 
come and see. We learn later in this chapter that the disciples were, of course, as I said, Andrew and John. Later in this chapter, Andrew will go and find his brother Simon and tell him that we, he and John, we have found the Messiah. What does that really entail? How is it that they have found the Messiah, this initial act of telling Peter, his brother, about the Messiah is one of the first accounts of evangelism in Scripture. Andrew and John meet Jesus and they spend the afternoon with him. And unless you spend any time with the Lord, you can't tell anybody else about it. I'm just going to keep it real tonight, so I, you know, I'm sorry if I, I sound a little bit fragmented and so on. That's just my methodology. That's how I do this thing of teaching, okay? Because I need to keep your attention. You know, it's only after they remain with Jesus that the first followers become believers. Point number one, this is very important to all of you. Unless you spend time with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you can never lead anyone else to Christ. Why? Because you don't know him. I'm just keeping it real. You don't know him. You're not going to know him. You can't know him. It's important to know that unless they had remained with Jesus, they would not and could not tell others about him. It's only when you meet him and spend time with him that you will have the desire to tell others about him. Why? Because you've got to fall in love with him. You have got to fall in love with him. And really... I hate to say it, but that's really been the problem with the church. We've fallen in love with everything else except for Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why we can't really get and confront people of why we're afraid. I'm afraid of rejection or I need somebody else to do this job. I'm not called to that area. Wrong. Wrong. I've got good news to you today. If, as you spend time with the King of Kings, he will spend time with you. Amen. If you spend time with Jesus, you'll have the desire to tell others about him. Why? Because as you spend time with Jesus, you're going to fall in love with him. Old things are going to be passed away, and behold, all things become new. Okay, that, that, I'm, I'm saying that for somebody because there's some stuff that has to fall off of you in order for you to really do the work of ministry, in order for you to witness to others, in order for you to live the life of Christ, there's stuff that's got to drop off. It's literally like this. I, have a, I used to have a sister. She's gone home to be with the Lord, but her name was Woody. And what he would tell me, she said, well, Al, you know, as, as, I, as I was growing up, you know, I used to smoke, I used to drink, I used to cuss people out in a heartbeat, okay, because I was mean and halfway crazy, okay? And she said, stop trying to fight that stuff on your own belief. It will drop off when the Lord wants it to drop off. And as you continue in Him, it's almost as if you're running and you begin to run out of all of the stuff that doesn't please him. You're going to run away from all of the stuff that is uh, that causes you not to be holy. You're going to run away from the stuff that causes you to damn others to hell when that's not our purpose as Christians. Yeah. And it's never been our purpose. Come on. So number one, as you spend time with Jesus, you'll have the desire to tell others about him. So what keeps you from evangelizing others when it's part of you? I got news. Good news. And evangelism is not what we do. It's who we are. It's who we are. But you say, weren't those got to... What didn't Andrew and John and Peter and Paul and the rest of the apostles, weren't they supermen and 
Jesus Christ because they hung out with him for three years and so on. And oh, by the way, I read a little bit somewhere in scripture, I think it's around the book of Ephesus, that, that letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus where he said, and the church really has these five things. It has the, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. Aren't those those five Five, uh, what do you call them, uh, ministers, uh, ministries of the church that somebody else is somebody else's responsibility to do it. It's Larry's responsibility to be the evangelist, it's Pastor Al to be one of the pastors. It's 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 somebody else's job to teach. It's somebody else's job, it's Sister Letitia's job to be the prophet of the house. Wow. Guess what? We're all called to do those things. Now, how does that work? Okay, yeah, so that is part of the fivefold ministry. The office gifts of the church, but let me explain it to you as I used to explain it to my students when I was teaching in Bible college. The fivefold ministry is not for the purpose of there to be an office gift so that somebody can say, look at me. We have a purpose to teach and grow up the church. So that what? So that we all come together. So guess what? You wind up doing exactly what those five-fold ministries are. Okay, in one way or another, you're going to land in some place in the body of Christ where God wants you to be that actually speaks to who you are in Him. And it is your gifting. Yes, amen. Amen. All of God. So it's to build up the church, the body of Christ. It doesn't require a degree, doesn't require an MD from Fuller, doesn't require a PhD in theology from Union Seminary in New York. All it takes is a genuine love of God and Jesus is only son. In John chapter four, Jesus meets a woman, I wanna call her Laquita. Amen. I'm going to call her Laquita. Why? Because we all know Laquita. She is on the run. She's living with a man that's not her husband. And in this case, in the story in John chapter 4, she cannot even go out to the well in the morning. She got to wait until the middle of the day. Why? Because Laquita, life hasn't been good to Laquita. Now, let me tell you who Laquita is today so that we can bring this up to the 21st century. Laquita has five kids, probably all from different daddies. She's on welfare, living in Section 8 housing. And uh, none of these da so-called daddies is paying. Whoa. Hello. He ain't showing up with no money for none of them kids. Okay? Life has paved in on Luquita. Why? Because that, see, church, we've got to, when I, when I look at John chapter 4, and I've been in church probably longer than most of you have been alive, okay? I have heard the woman at the well preached in all different kinds of ways. God, that Jesus had to deal with, with, with her sin issue. That's why he talked about her five husbands. No, he didn't. The poor woman was probably barren, which meant she had no support. And so these five husbands, she kept marrying them, hoping that somebody was going to bring her a son so that she would have sort a source in which to live under. But that never happened. So here's this woman. And you can hear the, all of the, the cackling that used to go on at the well in the morning around her. Let me put that in 20, 21st language. Girl, here she come. <laughs> Just like, I heard she had 15 husbands, child. Ain't got no kids just running, rip, ripping and running from man to man to man to man. I heard the man that she with you ain't even her, ain't her husband, nothing else. When at the same time, the only problem that this woman has is life has not been kind. When life is not kind, when life crashes in on you, Sometimes you make bad choices. 
You're going to make the only choice that you know to make, but in reality, you're making a bad choice. She was in need of Jesus. The woman at the well needed Jesus the same as Laquita today, who's on, on welfare and Section 8 housing needs Jesus as well. And that's a single mom. Or the single man that you see wandering the streets that's, that's all tatted up, got uh, earrings everywhere, here and here. And some other places I'm not going to talk about, but nonetheless, instead of getting a scowl from us, they need the Lord. We don't have to condemn them. Why? Because the Son of Man has already told us they already stand in condemnation. He didn't come to kill anybody. So why is it that we're trying to kill them off? We need to speak the truth to them and we need to speak the truth in love. How and why? Because that's what's inside of us if we know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yeah. So, in this case, life is caved in on Laquita. We know her story. Five failed marriages, most likely barren, outside the heat in the day, trying to get water. She doesn't have to be, so that she doesn't have to be confronted by her mistakes and her failures. In today's world, as I said earlier, she's a single mom. She's got four or five kids all along, well, living on welfare, living in Section 8 housing. The kids, the daddies, all, they all got different daddies who ain't paying no child support, and life has not been kind to them. But in the case of the woman at the well, this is what happened. In John chapter 4, she meets a man who asks her for a drink of water. You know the story, and basically, verse 15 sums up her existence. If you've actually looked at this story, if you look at verse 15, it says, Please, sir, give me this water. Then I will never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. That was, sums up what her case was. She was tired. Just like so many that we see in Walmart inappropriately dressed that we want to laugh about on Facebook, etc. I'm just keeping it real. Sometimes the stuff that we see, it's really not that. We need to really because we're the only Jesus they're going to see. They don't have the time, the energy, to get up, comb everybody's hair, put them, if they even got a hoopty, put them in the hoopty and bring them to church. So they're in the marketplace, they're at Walmart trying to get just enough food to get by for the week, and so on, and we're sitting up there going, ee, 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 just like those women were doing the woman at the well. And they're saying, we don't want to I just can't deal with that anymore. And they're right. But what happens with the woman at the well? She meets a man named Jesus. Tells her all about everything that she's ever done. And what's her response? Because just like those two future apostles, she spends time. She actually said, I wish I had one, just a second, because I'm kind of just demonstrative when I do things. She set that water pot down and set down beside him literally and listen to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And people who do that find out that he truly is who he says he is. He is the Messiah. And so what happens is, is she doesn't even pick up the water pot, but she runs back to the village. And she says, she spent enough time with him to hear his message and believe. And what does that speak to us about evangelism? She didn't have a degree. She had, as a matter of fact, I can tell you for, for one thing for sure, she was married five times and she can't get 
uh, credentials with the Assemblies of God, much less any other de denomination for that matter. Okay, well, I, I'm just keeping it real, okay? I'm sorry. She ain't getting it. You're sorry you got to go somewhere else if you thought you was going to get some credentials from us to say that you were an evangelist. You ain't getting them from here. Go somewhere else. Okay. This message has been brought to you by our own. I'm sorry. I wasn't supposed to say that. That's the reality. Okay. But it, as I said earlier, evangelism does not take an in-depth from forward. Doesn't take a PhD. All it takes is a love for Jesus Christ in order for you to carry out the word of the evangelist. Why? Because in, if we go on a little farther, there's a story that, that happens over in Timothy and in, in, in 2 Timothy 3.15 and actually the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, who, oh, oh, by the way, just so that you'll know who he is, is Timothy is the bishop of Ephesus and he tells him, Paul tells him do the work of the evangelist. Why? Because it's inside of him. You know, he's already exhorted him, don't be challenged by the fact that you're young. Don't let him tell, tear you down because of that. But you know who God is because it was first given to you and the, that same spirit that was in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice is the same spirit that's in him today. And so the Apostle Paul is going to exhort him to say, do the work of the evangelist. Why? Because people need to know who Jesus is. Amen. Okay. Whether they're in the church or out of the church. One other thing about this wonderful thing called evangelism, it's rooted in community. It's not about the individual. One of the, uh, uh, Larry talked about a time when I saw him and I said, no, I want you to go out with two at least. And the reason for that is it's because the body of Christ is a community. Prayer is a community. The, the work of ministry is a community. We've got to join together. We can't let stuff keep daring us apart because of who we are. And we believe this way and somebody else believes the other way. And I'm glad to see that shift in the 21st century church to tell you the truth. I got some friends that are in some other denominations who will remain nameless. And their names of these pastors are going to remain nameless. But they do some stuff now that they used to wouldn't do. And I'm glad to see it. I am glad to see it. And I'm glad that we can now talk to one another. Because back when I was a little bit young, we would be caught dead with anybody from an Assemblies of God church. Period. Okay? I'm just keeping it real. But about evangelism, back to what this is truly about. It's about all of these people that live in this neighborhood around here. And beyond. Everybody in Sacramento, God, El Grove. Rockland, Roseville, and Lincoln needs to know who Jesus is. Yes. Real Lincoln, North Highlands, all of us need to know who Jesus is. Now, how do we do that as believers? Because number one, it's rooted in community. In both instances, the future apostles and the woman at the well. came under the unction of the Holy Spirit to tell someone else about Jesus. Yeah. In the case of the apostles of John, it was his brother James. And the apostle Andrew, it was his brother Simon. Oh, you know Simon, you Peter, the one that walked on water, and, 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 and so on, and later on is going to become the head of the church. And, and, and is going to be crucified upside down, is going to preach for 3,000 people. It was Andrew that brought him to the Messiah. And so it goes on. And you don't have no idea of what the person that you're going to talk to is going to have to do in the body of Christ. So you can be talking to somebody. I remember my mother was was talking to a to a little boy. I I know she didn't think that this was what was going to happen with this kid, but she kept teaching him at, at when he was in her Sunday school class, and and somehow this 
little boy grew up and he went on to college and he went on to Harvard and finished Harvard in three years and he became a man that many of you know here in Sacramento. His name was Cornell West. And the last time he and I met, he was speaking, and he started to talk about his teacher, Sarah Ray. Well, Sarah Ray was my mother. And because she basically took this guy and just said, you can do better, you can do this, you can do that. Not that she did it all by herself, but that's really how evangelism works. We don't know what that person is going to be. To be honest with you, we have no idea are they going to become the pastor of a great church. I can assure you that somebody had to get a hold of our pastor back in the day to not only to, to give him a word that kept coming back to him, but then to also give him that push that got him to go into ministry. And if you listen to him, he talks about those people that were in his lives. All of us had them. I had them. I just lost my men my last of one of the last of my mentors I just lost here about three or four weeks ago. Her name was Emma Emma Wood, Woodard. She was my high school Sunday school teacher. And just the stuff that she did, she was the one that explained to me. First of all, she was a teacher. She taught at Ethel Phillips Elementary School over here on 65th. But she taught me a about what was going to happen when I got to college and how to respond to the different things and to let God to do the stuff that, that only he could do in my life. And so I wind up going overseas for a year of college and some other things that have changed my life forever for the good. But for each one of us, we have that ability. There are six people that I can touch that you don't know and you cannot touch. They're in my sphere of influence. And just like I have six of them, so do you. Every last one of us in this room has at least six people or more that we have influence with that can't nobody else touch. Nobody else can touch them. Nobody else can talk to them in the manner in which you can talk to them. That's what evangelism is about. If you've fallen in love with Jesus, what happens to us is we begin to first to talk to those people about him. I have some guys that I know from elementary school and uh, there, there are two brothers. One of them was at our wedding, uh, and he always calls me the stealth pastor because they were Catholic and I don't wear a collar. So, so he, Randy would always laugh at me and say, Pal, you're, 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 you're a stealth pastor. We can't tell by the clothing who you are. <laughs> go, well, it's Jesus that's in me. But he would always call me whatever stuff went on. Him and his older brother, John, who was also a friend of mine. We play golf every once in a while together. And John will call me and, and he'll say, well, what's going on? What are you doing? And, and, and so on. And we'll talk about things not just about the Lord, but about life. Why? Because I've learned over time that it takes not just my witness, but it takes my life. Some of us, the only epistle that a person is going to get to read in that group of six people is how you act in life. If they don't see you being argumentative and doing stuff that looks horrifying, to, that looks abhorrent, that, that speaks of rejecting people and talking about people. If they don't see that in your life, but they see the love of Christ in you, guess what? That's a, almost a greater witness than you're saying anything about something that's in this book to them. And we've got to get back to that. Because that's actually what the apostles did after Jesus left.
That was why there were 3,000 saved at Pentecost. And it's why uh, Stephen could give that word and then die for Christ. Why? Because he loved him with all of his heart, mind, soul, and spirit. It's the same thing with us. As we love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and spirit, we're going to be able to witness to people in the way that we should be doing as believers. And we'll do it. We can. And we First Peter 3.15 Always be ready with a response for the hope that is in you. Evangelism is not complicated. It really isn't. It, it's actually very easy. It's something that we can do by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not something that we just do. It's already resident in us. It's as much resident in us as prayer, as in a singing of a song, or as just having a smile at somebody in the marketplace. You know, every once in a while, if you let somebody go in front of you in line, it's just that simple. When somebody sees that, hey, you know, I'm in a little bit of a hurry here. I'm going to go past me. Go ahead. Come on in. Be sweet. That's what Pastor says in his new book. Be light. Be light. Why? Because Jesus was the light of the world. And we're told that we're a city on a hill. And we are going to either positively evangelize people around us, or we're going to negatively do it by what we say and do. It has more to do with that than it has to do with anything else. So I want to encourage you tonight. I have good news for you. Evangelism is not just something that we do. It's who we are as believers in Christ Jesus. Some of you are not going to, to be able to go overseas as I do to places like Brazil and some other places that I'm going to be going in future years to speak a truth, to speak the truth and love to other nations. You might not be able to stand before people, even if I'm going here. But you know what? I studied, and when I was in college, I studied something that was called political science. And what we learned in that is, is that there was this thing that was called a grassroots movement. It's the grassroots that have basically won every uh, presidential election in this country. Why? Because it's the people that dealt with the six people in their circle of friends, the people that they had influence. Hey, you know, for so and so, and here's why, because he does this, 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 and this. And we learned in political science that that's how campaigns are run. And the same way in the kingdom. Why else would the greatest teacher of all use the example of yeast? <laughs> Any cooks in the house beside myself? You know what yeast does? A little bit goes on the way. And the same thing is true of evangelism. A little bit goes a long way. It doesn't take a whole lot. One of the things I love about this church is when I got here, Pastor Sam said something to a group of us at one point and said, you know what, it really only takes about two minutes when you're up here at the altar to really pray for somebody. You know, because the bottom line is, is yeah, I, I remember, remember standing up at the, at the end of church as, a, as either as a deacon or as a pastor and praying for people for I don't know how long sometimes, you know, to try and get rid of whatever it was that they were going through. But the reality is this. It's just like he, he spoke a word. Be healed in the name of Jesus. You know, walk with me for just a second. Now drop off that thing over there, that, 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 that mad face that you got at that person. Let that hurt go. Yeah. Forgive them. As you forgive them. And as you tell them that you love them with the love of the Lord. 
And I don't care what they look like. I don't care if it's Laquita or if it's James or Jimmy or whoever it is with all the earrings and everything else going on and whatnot and so, so, so forth and so on. The reality is, is that all of those people, they need a savior. And that savior's name is Jesus Christ. Are you with me today? Are you with me? Because that's who we serve, the King of Kings and the Lord of God. God bless you and keep you tonight.